Welcome, my friends, to the Sage Equay Radio Hour, your home for free and critical thinking, and I'm your host, Mike Williams. Returning to the show today is fellow Beatles researcher Ofer Zevi. Ofer is from Israel, and he recently published his book, The Best Show in the World, which presents and discusses his research into the McCartney and Beatles conspiracy. And so without further ado, here's Ofer. Well, folks, we have a great show. Ofer Zevi is back with me, and uh, Ofer has just released his own Paul is Dead book, and it's the first of its type in Israel. And so we're going to talk about his experience with releasing the book on June 30th of this year, 2021, and how it's going, and also to to get Ofer's insights on various other aspects of the conspiracy. I, I hold... Ofer's research in high regard, and I really do enjoy uh, talking with you, Ofer. And welcome back to the show. Tell us a little bit about what motivated you to write the book. Well, <clears throat> um, as I explained, uh, first of all, hi, Mike, and thanks for, for having me on your show again. Uh, as I explained in my uh, in the opening comments uh, of my book, uh, I basically grew up on the rumor and um but it was something that was i mean left out for for many years and all of a sudden it came back i mean and uh so this is something i had to just check um because why would we need two narratives <laughs> i mean we have a story right it's not true because it was only a rumor uh, it relates to the biggest band in the world. And, uh, so what, what's going on? I mean, it was really fascinating, uh, fascinating to really re-examine, uh, the two narratives. And in fact, this is what I've done in my book because you don't get a situation where one of the most famous people in the world, not only in music, is presenting us with Two narratives, which are completely different for a story. I mean, the Beatles story, if you're, you know, the average Beatles fan, you know the story, you know the albums, you know the music. So all of a sudden, um, something completely new. So why? Why is that? And this, this was the, um, the main reason. And I also wanted to really to uh, try and, um, bring the subject out here uh, in Israel. And my position in the book, by the way, is I, I, of course, support the new information because the old information has many holes, and we'll talk about it today. But I'm leaving the subject open for anyone to read, check the references, all of my references are, you know, open. I mean, videos on YouTube, your videos, books you can buy on Amazon. I don't have any secret uh, <laughs> information from a secret source. And everyone can read and think for himself. And I write it very, cl very clearly. You need to have a lot of, uh, you, you need to do a lot of critical thinking. But I'm saving you. I mean, not you, but the, the, ever, the reader time, because I try to, to cover as much as I can and present um, as much information as I can about the subject. Okay, and how has the, the book been received over in, in Israel? Well, um, I think that the Beatles fans don't like it, to, <laughs> to say the least. I think... Uh, the people who are not avid Bills fans are more open to read it and to ask questions because they don't know exactly, you know, what the Bills timeline was or what happened each and every month in the timeline of the Bills. And they're more open to question, to investigate. It's very hard to sell the new information to a person who is an avid Beatles fan because everything is very clear to them. I mean, the, the timeline, the information, the old information, the official information. 
Now, I, I thought about myself and I had to digest the new information in bits. I mean, I saw your presentation and I got the memoirs and it took time. And here in one book, which is my book, I'm giving them everything in almost 250 pages. So it's very difficult to digest all at once. But again, I'm giving them all the references, everything they can check and decide for themselves. If they see Olivia Harrison uh, speaking to Paul McCartney behind stage, behind the stage and calling him Hello Billy, it's open for interpretation. It's either uh, you think that this, what you're seeing is real, or maybe somebody played with a video. Think about it. But for, fortunately for us, this is not uh, the only piece of information we have. We have many pieces of, inf of new information. So it's not that we are depending on uh, just one video. But again, it's uh, that's my position. I trust the new information because it's more, it makes more sense to me. Okay. And, but again, everyone can read and judge for themselves. How are you getting the book out? How are you disseminating? How, how are people becoming aware of it? Um, I have a Facebook page and a LinkedIn page. Um, I'm selling my book through my website. Um, so this is what you may call independent, uh, an independent, uh, way of selling. So it's, it's more, um, it's more difficult because you don't have the, uh, the attention, the attention of the big, uh, book companies here in Israel, but it's okay for me. And I think that, uh, we know that we have to be very patient with this story, which you and I know that started, I mean, the new, the new phase started in 2006. And I mentioned it also in my, my book with the, um, Paul is dead. I am a phony, uh, channel. And then 2009, the first memoirs, 2018, the second memoirs, then Bill is back, your presentations in recent years. So it takes time. We're 15 years in the, uh, what I call the new information era. So it's going to take more time. I mean, we'll have, uh, hopefully new information in the third edition of memoirs this October. And I'm, I'm sure that more things will happen uh, as we go along. So if people don't discover my book now, maybe there will be an opportunity to discover it uh, sometime later. Now, when we spoke about two weeks ago, we were chatting on Skype. You had mentioned that you had the opportunity to talk about the book on Israeli mainstream outlets. A radio station, yes. Radio station. Okay. How did that go? Well, I had some... Uh, some connections and the guy who is doing a weekly uh, show about culture in general, <clears throat> he just interviewed me and it was a very positive interview, but other channels, I mean, um, television, radio, newspapers and major websites, they just want, don't want to, to, to deal with it for the time being. They want hard proof. They want either DNA results. They want the press conference. They want to hear the man himself speak. We don't know if this is going to happen. I think this is not going to happen. Um, and also they find it difficult to understand gradual disclosure. He said that we want the information right here, right now. Right. Or don't bother us. But this, the process here, the gradual, gradual disclosure, this is something that is, is difficult to, to handle. But that's the way we're getting the information. I mean, every now and then we get some new information and we have to analyze it. And, uh, that's, that's just the way it works. And I'm telling them, listen, um, we can talk about it now. Even if you pause my information, Let's talk about it. Let's see what resonates with you. But it falls under the fake news, uh, you know, headline. So there's really nothing I can do about it. <laughs> it's interesting because there is disclosure. He has disclosed from the, the sheer fact that he has released 
memoirs through Tom. The man that is playing the part has written a book, but they don't even want to be bothered with that, right? No. Because they go back, how do we know he actually is behind the book and, and all of that? And even when you try to explain how it is that he is behind the book, because all you need to do is to start to connect some dots, and you can very easily see and conclude that he has to be behind the writing of the memoirs of Billy Shears. You had mentioned, Ofer, that there are red flags or holes in the narrative. Yes. Can you give us examples of what you're talking about there? Yes. In one of the chapters in my book, I focused on the time, uh, the fall of 1966, right after the Beatles came back from uh, their last appearance on Cam uh, at Candlestick Park, and all the way up to the Christmas period of 1966. So we're talking about September, October, November, and December. But this is a period where, uh, if you check the Beatles timeline, nothing major happened. No new music, no shows, no group interviews. But this should have been, uh, but we know that a lot of, a lot has happened because that's the, the turning point in the story. And I found at least four uh, major things that did happen. And the people who support the official narrative claim that they are just um, circumstances. And I call them holes in the narrative. Okay, so it's, again, two different perspectives. The first thing I found is the Beatles' complete stoppage of performing live. Now, this is something that is very unusual for a major band to continue recording, and we know that they, they continue to record five more albums, starting with Sgt. Pepper in 67, until they broke up, but they completely stopped performing live. This is something which is very unusual for, an, 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 not talking only of the Beatles, I'm talking about take any band or any artist. And of course, there were excuses for the stoppage of live performances. Uh, the backlash from the uh, John Lennon comment about the Beatles being more popular than Jesus. And I think this is not, uh, this is not an excuse for me because this only happened in the US. I mean, they could do, they could have continued to perform in Europe or in other places where nobody cared about what John Lennon said. Then they said that the Beatles were, the, the uh, band members were tired because the schedule, the, the, uh, the lineup was very hectic. I mean, the doing 19 shows in 17 days. But again, they could have taken some time off, four, five, six months, and go back on the road. I mean, this is something that they've done before. They appeared four, uh, 1,461 times, according to the website setlist.fm, between 1960 and 1966. This is, I mean, wow. This is like every three, two shows every three days on average for six years. So you don't go from that to zero. It doesn't, make, it doesn't make sense. And of course, they were the number one band in the world. So all of a sudden, normal live gigs. So this should have raised a really a red flag among other Beatles fans. Uh, but Beatles fans usually they accept the narrative. So if the Beatles said that they were tired, or that they suffer from the backlash from what John Lennon said, they accept it. No critical thinking, no questioning why did the, the greatest man in the world, who appeared almost 1,500 times, stopped performing completely until they broke up, with one exception, which is the rooftop performance on, in January of 69. So this is one thing. Then... Um, Another thing I found was uh, no new music for the holidays. Now, we know in general that the, the um, Thanksgiving to New Year's is uh, 
what we call you know, the, the Christian world, uh, the holiday season. For businesses, uh, it's a very lucrative time of the year, okay? I mean, a lot of businesses in many different areas sometimes do 50 to 60% of their annual income just in those six, seven weeks, the last weeks of every calendar year. Now, the Beatles issued new music every year before. 62, there was one single, but in 63, 64, and 65, there was new music, new singles, and, new, and, new, and a new album. And of course, they did very well during the holiday season. And then we come to 1966, and all of a sudden, no new music. Why is that? Okay, so that's another thing which uh think about. Well, another example, Ofer, of the holiday season and getting material out, whether a single or an album, is Rubber Soul. Yes. They wanted Rubber Soul in the stores in retail by December 3rd so that they could capitalize on the holiday season. So 1966, no new music. And this is a question. Also, we know they did a lot of group interviews, and all of a sudden, in the forthcoming months after, starting from September, there were separate interviews. And I checked that. We don't see them together. Okay? Um, and also, there is the story of the movie The Family Way which is not a very important movie, but the story here is that the movie was promoted by the soundtrack because the soundtrack was written by Paul McCartney. If you check the album, it says music composed by Paul McCartney. Now, this is, uh, I think, recorded in October of 66 or something like that. And, of course, uh, it's you can find it in memoirs that... Uh, Billy admits that he was the one who wrote the music. Now, the thing here is, the, the, the question here was, how can a person who did not know to read or write music compose a score for an orchestra, an instrumental score, 24 minutes, and you can listen to it online nowadays, for the movie The Family Way, okay? I'm talking before memoirs. If you just check that, and um, even in the book we're going to talk about soon, uh, many years from now, or other Beatles books, um, there are quotes about Paul McCartney, and we're talking about biological Paul, not knowing music theory, not knowing how to read and run music, and I'm not talking about pop songs, okay? Maybe you can uh, deal with pop songs. I'm talking about writing music for the guy who's playing the cello, the guy who's playing the violin, writing music and writing a score. So how, how, is it, how is it possible? But this is something when I talk to people here in Israel, the Beatles fans, they don't know. But they don't care. I mean, it's not a big deal for them. It's not an important movie. It's not an important sound, an important soundtrack. But again, it's still, it's an open question. And it should raise a red flag. This is not possible for a guy with no music theory. And we're talking about 1966. No computers, no software. You need to write it on a piece of paper, you know, sheet music. Right. Simple. So this is something, um, that, um, um, this is on page uh, 239 in memoirs. Uh, again, uh, the book says that uh, Paul could not read or write music, confirms that. Uh, there was also an interview, I think, in 2018, where uh, Billy said that, uh, mentioned the fact that he didn't know what he was talking about, of course, biological Paul. He didn't know how to read or write music. So again, this should really at least initiate a discussion among Beatles fans. What's going on here? Well, this is reinforced also by the other Beatles. So John Lennon in the Playboy interview going back to 1980, he clearly stated that they could not read or write music. And there's a uh, interview I actually rewatched, and it was George Harrison on the Dick Cavett show. 
And in that interview, George said that he could not read or write music. So Lennon was talking about the, the band as a whole. Harrison was talking about himself. And there are multiple interviews out there where Billy says that he, as Paul McCartney, the Paul McCartney character, could not read or write music. But we clearly see evidence to the contrary, where he, as William, he's trained. He's a composer. He can score music. So that's a very, very good point. I, I wanted to go back to something, though, um, that you mentioned earlier, Ofer. I want to make sure we cover this. Two things. The other thing with them playing live would be the height difference, right, between Paul and yes. Billy and biological Paul. Right. So that would have been a lot easier to see. Yes. And you can clearly see the difference on the rooftop concert, which you just mentioned. Yeah. Uh, they did fil film it from the side. They separated. I mean, Billy was on one side, John Lennon and George Harrison on another side, but you can clearly see. I think they lowered the microphone for uh, Billy also. So he leans with his head. If you get a chance to see it again, you'll see it. But uh, I see the differences in height uh, clearly. Yeah, I do too. And it's interesting that you should mention Let It Be because, uh, folks, we did talk a little bit about Let It Be before we got started here. And uh, I had mentioned that we see this lanky type of character, Paul McCartney in Let It Be. You can tell he has long legs. And you're right. During the filming of Let It Be, there are many situations throughout the film where they try to disguise Billy's height to kind of position him so that he, he looks smaller and he's in line with the rest of the Beatles, in particular with, with John and George. The other thing, too, Alpha, that you mentioned is uh, the Beatles, their concerts made money and uh, they were very profitable. So can you talk to us a little bit about that? Because um, this is something that I have mentioned previously where they did make EMI, uh, they actually made the British government a lot of money, but you went through some of the numbers. So take us through that a little bit. Well, I checked uh, some information on the last tour in the U.S. in August of 1966. And another reason to at least question the reasoning behind the complete stoppage of um, live performances is that uh, these performances were very lucrative. I found out the, that the average price ticket um, on the tour, I think, was five bucks. I know it sounds ridiculous today, but uh, we're talking about 1966. I, I think it uh, in New York, it shared the average price was five bucks and 65 cents. But regardless, let's say it's five bucks. So if 50,000 people went to Shea, for a 35 minutes show, revenue was $250,000. That's a lot. Right. We're talking about 1966. I mean, it's a lot of money today, but, uh, think going back to 1966. So if you add, uh, those 19 shows, I found out that the, uh, they made the prop, the revenue approximately was between three to four million dollars. Okay. And this is for, uh, 30 to 35 minutes show. I'm not belittling the uh, difficulties of running from town to town. I know it's tiring. It's very difficult. But again, that's the uh, life on the road. I mean, back in 1966, for the Beatles and the controllers, this was very, very lucrative. So stopping that completely looks very strange to me. Okay, and again, they, they could have taken a few months rest, re, uh, get it together and go on the road again. I mean, in the uh, 67, 68, 69, uh, but we know that didn't happen. And again, the biggest band in the world. Uh, <laughs> so this is what I found. Right. Just stopped. Now, the other question I have for you is that some folks might be saying, oh, hold on a second, Ofer. The Beatles did release material for Christmas in 1966, and it was the album A Collection the oldies. of Oldies. Yes. Yeah. So why doesn't that count? I'm talking about new music. This was the case, again, in the previous years. Um, and uh, in fact, the following year, 67, you have you had the Magical Mystery Tour, etc. But again... 
the problem with the oldies album is first of all no no new music which we talked about and then you're talking about all this from the previous three years I mean usually when a band issues an all this album it covers a range of more years or more music so again I'm not saying that this by itself is questionable but if you add that to the other things uh, and again people who trust the um, official narrative and It seems so uh, circumstantial to them right I don't think it's so uh, circumstantial I think it happened because a major major thing happened and that's the, the death and replacement of uh, Paul McCartney um, um, this supports the theory okay and this is in addition to the um, very different look of the new Paul around this uh, time period. And we can see it in uh, separate places. I mean, there is, if you even check the official pictures from the uh, family way, there's some photos. Um, I'll try to send you some. Uh, and you see the guy with the fake mustache, the wig, the long face, and sitting in front of uh, a few people, the guy with the cello, the guy with the violin. And he's like... Um, explaining to them or conducting them. I don't know what's going on on that. That's the official pictures for the family way. That's October 66. November 66, you have the pictures from the Kenya visit. Bailey with Mal Evans. You can see that, you can see it, uh, it was still the images. Or if you check several of the I Am A Phony videos, you can see, you can see him there in Nairobi, Kenya. The same guy we see in the reporting 66 which is a telev- a British television show where we see Billy with his new look telling to the camera I'm not dead I'm just a good replica okay right. we see consistency and also late January the shooting of the Penny Lane and Strawberry Fields forever videos again you see the same guy the fake mustache the wig the long face the Again, I see two different people, you know, so <laughs> it's such a better, of course, later on yeah and and collection of all these is a very interesting album because just the title of the album, as you mentioned before, offer a collection of oldies. well, these songs aren't old. The oldest song on the album is about three years, right? Yes, why wasn't it called a collection of hits? Yes, so oldies was a a point of delineation. So oldies meant the old band, songs from the old lineup. And then going forward, it's going to be the music of the new lineup, which included Billy. And of course, the album that followed Collection of Oldies is Sgt. Pepper. So the Collection of Oldies album, even though it kind of gets lost in the sauce many times when you talk about Beatle releases, is actually a very important album from a... From a symbolism perspective, it's very symbolic of the change that took place. Would you agree? Yes, and of course you need uh, very little time to put out a collection album. I mean right. um, the music is already has already been recorded, but again, this is was very unusual because the group always recorded and performed live. All of a sudden, no new music, no more live shows. So at least I mean people should question what was going on, what was going on in that uh, time period so this is something I wrote about um, um, and I try to show that uh, something big happened you know the only other um, I mean I checked a lot of other major artists in the 60s and the only other occur- occurrence which reminds uh, which is well, similar in a way was the Bob Dylan story July 29th of 1966 he had his um, accident and after that uh, different um, well we don't know what happened after that <laughs> he stopped performing at least for a year and a half yeah. he disappeared there are rumors that uh, the new Bob Dylan is someone else but I don't want to get into that because you know I didn't right. check that and it's right. a long story but anyway he Artists usually record music and perform. It's that, uh, that's what they do. 
And I don't have to tell you that. I mean, you're a musician and you know a lot about the music world. Again, these red flags really stand out for me to show that something big happened. That's how I read it. Yeah, and before we move on, because we're going to talk about your research into Barry Miles' book many years from now, but before we go there, you and I actually talked about this offline going back, oh, several months ago. But when we talk about the set lists and the songs that the Beatles were playing, when we go back to the concert tour that they were doing after Revolver was released, they didn't play any songs from Revolver. And I've spoken about this on my channel a number of times, but did you want to talk about that a little bit? That, because that's yes. just very strange. Um, we talked about it last time. Um, again, the same set list, 11 songs, maybe on some of the show there was a 12th song, but the same songs every day. Okay, so no, very, no very variation. And also two of the 11 songs were covers we're talking about 1966, after the Beatles already issued seven albums, they had many songs and many hits from which to choose. Why do you play two covers out of an 11 set, uh, songs set list? This is very strange. I mean, I know, we know that they loved covering old rock and roll songs, but come on, you're the Beatles, you're the biggest band in the world. You have already seven albums with many, many hits. I mean, people know the songs and people buy the music. So not only no new songs from Revolver, right after you issue the album and you go on tour, but also only 11 songs every night on the stage and two out of the songs are covers. This is very strange to me. I know that uh, other major groups, once they establish themselves, themselves and they issue new music, and they become successful, no need to play covers anymore. Right. So we're talking about the Beatles, 1966. This is uh, three years after they started, or a little more, maybe four years. And we see that they play two covers. This is very strange. Yeah, you know, it, it is very strange. And um, it's something that indicates that, and you and I have talked about this, the reason for it is because they hadn't learned how to play the songs after they went into sing the vocals for Revolver, because my premise is based upon Rubber Soul, that they sang on the recorded tracks. They didn't play on them. And because they had not learned how to play the songs on Revolver, they weren't taught the songs, they weren't able to take them on the road afterward. That's my thinking. The newest song that they played on the concert, the, the tour, was, I think, Paperback Writer. Yeah. Which was the single from the spring of 66. And it was uh, number one in the USA uh, around that time. So this is a song they did play. But again, nothing new from Revolver to promote the album. To promote the single, we talked about it, Elinor Rigby and Yellow Submarine, double A side. Again, this should raise questions among Beatles fans, but this is something uh, I don't see people talking about or questioning. I saw in Wikipedia, it says that they opted not to play songs from Revolver. That's what we get in Wikipedia. They opted. Well, okay. <laughs> yeah. Can I say? Well, they would have blew the audience away if they had fired up Taxman. I'm sure. Right? I'm sure. Or as you and I have talked about before, why couldn't they have done a scaled-down version of Yellow Submarine? Yes. So it's it's very, very strange. And uh, like I said, Ofer, you and I are on the same page with this. The reason in all likelihood is because they didn't know how to play those songs. Now, let's talk about... Barry Miles and his book, Many Years From Now. So can you tell us a little bit about who Barry Miles is? Yes. And in fact, this is something which is not in my book because my book is so, I mean, condensed with information. And I didn't, this is something I uh, worked upon, uh, but I didn't put it in, inside my book because, uh, again, my book is crammed <laughs> with tons of information. And for somebody who just reads it, I think this would uh, this would have been too much. But 
Again, we're, we're still in a stage of uh, two narratives, which is, again, very strange. I mean, why, why would you need a new narrative if we already have the official narrative? So what I did, and I'm sure you have uh, old Bills books, I mean, the, the, I mean, the average Bills fan, uh, I know people here in Israel have books from the UK, from the US. Um, and I picked this book because um, it was very interesting. I mean, um, Barry Miles was a colleague of the Beatles. He was a British writer and author. He was a close friend of the Beatles. And he knew both Pauls because we know that uh, he knew Paul from 65, at least from 1965. Um, he was also one of the co-owners of the Indica Gallery, which was a very famous place in London. That's the place where uh, Yoko uh, met John Lennon. And he helped start the indie newspaper, International Times. And his book, Many Years From Now, was issued in 1997. And his book is basically based on hundreds of hours of 35 exclusive taped different interviews he conducted with Billy between 1991 and 1996. So they basically went over all of the um, Beatles narratives from beginning to end. And it was very interesting to uh, read um, what uh, Billy had to say. Now, we have to also remember that this book came two years after the anthology. I think that at the round at that time, this was a major release because you get, I mean, a lot of information from, uh, well, supposedly Paul McCartney. Um, and it talks a lot, a, a lot about the writing of the songs, which we'll get to in a second. Now, the exercise I did, I bought this book in 97 or 98, and I haven't touched it for so many years, but I, I decided to reread it. And the main thing I found out, or the main exercise I did with myself, is whenever I saw the word Paul, column, and then a quote, I changed in my head the word Paul to Billy, and try to figure out what he's telling us, or what was going on. Okay? Now, this is something, of course, I <laughs> couldn't have done in the past. But knowing the new information now, I wanted to see how he describes the, the, the old narrative, or the official narrative. And I found a lot of very interesting stuff. Now, the main thing I found, and this is something I wanted to hear your take on, he describes a lot of the writing of the songs, the Beatles songs, and he always talks about, this is a 50-50 song, I mean 50% me, 50% John, or 80% me, 20% John, or vice versa. And I have to keep reminding myself that Billy, at that time, according to the new information, was the ghostwriter, or one of the ghostwriters for the Beatles. So maybe what he is describing, either it's a made-up story, or made-up stories, or this is what actually happened. He went to John's house, or John went to his house, they sat together, I'm talking about Billy and John, Maybe there were sessions with biological Paul, which is very interesting. And the actual division between the who wrote what is mainly because Bill Shepard and John Lennon. Now, this is a possibility. We have no way to find out. But I'm reading, again, song after song. There are a lot of, I mean, it talks about many of the songs on the albums. And between 62 and 66, uh, he was behind the scenes. So maybe while in London, they did meet. They had conversations for song ideas. Maybe they started writing. What's your take on it? Is it possible? So are you saying, oh, make sure I understand the premise here, that this goes back to pre-1967, so biological Paul is still in the picture, and you're saying that is it possible that Billy was there with both John and Bio Paul and they were talking through songs? Maybe. I mean, I'm questioning. 
it's possible. We weren't there. We don't know. Song ideas, themes for songs. Lines. Lines, that type of thing there. And if Billy was in the picture as a ghostwriter and as a session musician back during the 62 through 66 period, it's very possible that these types of discussions went on. Now, the thing is, Billy wasn't, if he was ghostwriting, and I do think he was because I think he dropped us a big clue when he talked about that he wrote the music to In My Life. Yes. Okay, so when he said that um, the mainstream media went into damage control, saying, oh, no, no, he misremembered, you know, a computer analysis uh, shows us that it was indeed John Lennon that wrote the song and so on. And you and I have talked about this. I mean, there is no way that you misremember writing a song like In My Life, which is one of the most famous rock and roll songs of all time. You just don't forget that. So I think that Billy was there. It's possible that they were, you know, that these ghost writers and these songwriters, and I do not think it was just Billy. I think they had probably, I'm taking a guess here, maybe they had a half dozen songwriters that were on the EMI staff, Tavistock staff, that were there to formulate and put together these songs. And yes, it's quite possible that the Beatles themselves shared ideas, thoughts, had input into themes for songs, what these songs might sound like. It's possible. I would say that if they did have those types of uh, dialogues and conversations, I, I don't think it was the norm. I would think that maybe it was one-off types of situations where they were able to sit down together and talk about stuff. My take on it is that, generally speaking, the way it worked is George Martin, and in all likelihood working with Theodore Adorno in the background, were responsible for taking in song content that would ultimately wind up on the recorded albums. That's how I think it worked in general. George Martin was directing and managing this process. His role was far, far more than what is depicted in the official narrative. And they just basically depict him as a producer and he had some ideas and he was very good with the technology and all that stuff. But in my view, based upon my research, it goes way, way beyond that. But your premise that perhaps they did have conversations and dialogue with uh, Bio Paul and John, anything's possible. I mean, you can't discount it. I mean, they had to run into each other, right? They, they had to be in the studio. They had, maybe they ran into each other outside the studio because it was, it was an operation. It was an initiative. It, it was a project. And you had all these people that were in the mix. And to think that they did not interact with each other once in a while, I, I don't think that that's a likely scenario. They, they did run into each other and they did have conversations. So I think you're possibly right. That could have happened. So this is, this was the main thing that I, I was, I was thinking about. I did find other, other stuff. Um, while uh, rereading many years from now from Barry Miles, I think there are a lot of made-up stories there. I mean, the, the two songs, uh, She's a Woman and Lovely Rita, where you read the description and Paul says, well, Billy says that he wrote them on the street. How can you write a song while walking on the street? Well, maybe, <laughs> I don't know. Well, we get a lot of stories like that where they say that they wrote these great songs on the fly. And I don't put a lot of stock in those stories at all. I think that those are stories that are put out there to do exactly what you're saying, is to show how great they were, what geniuses they were. But in reality, the probability that that's how songs were written, especially some of these songs, which were really phenomenal songs, that's not how they were written. Yeah, so this was very strange. And then... Uh, I found another story where uh, Paul is talking about in my life, which we, we just mentioned two yeah. minutes ago, and he says um, that he arrived at John's house when he started reminiscing about the old days in Liverpool, and then John, John had a few words and Paul started a tune, and then there's a quote, I sat there and put together a tune based in my mind on Smokey Robinson and the Miracles. Songs like You've Really Got a Hold on Me and Tears of a Clown had really been a big influence. You will fell back to something you've loved. 
So I, I recall writing the whole melody. Now, the only problem with that is these songs were written and issued at least two years after 1965. So how can you write a song based on, in 1965, which is based on a song issued in 67? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, but again, this is maybe an anecdote. I mean, I'm not, uh, but I, I think that um, there are many different type of, uh, this, uh, um, the way uh, Billy describes writing the songs, which if you, if you really read it carefully, you at least have to ask yourself a question or questions. What is talking about? What, what really, what really happened? So, uh, um, and then there's a day in the life. Um, and he describes writing the orchestra part for a day in the life. And he says, we wrote out the music for the part where the orchestra had proper chords to do. After the line, somebody spoke and I went into a dream. And two pages later, he says the two conductors, that, that's the uh, Barry Mises writing, the two conductors raised their batons, George Martin in evening dress, and Paul McCartney in a red butcher's apron and a purple and black psychedelic paisley shirt, and recording began. So he's describing, he's describing a situation where George Martin and Paul McCartney conducted the instrumental yes but we know that paul did not know how to read or write music so now we, all of a sudden he's a conductor so this is this was very 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 strange and um we know it is cl clearly billy with george martin managing the orchestra but again the average reader of the book can gather from this quote that paul did know did know how to write and read music and it's very confusing well it also tells us that the relationship between Billy and George Martin was very tight. Yes. And so I, you know, as I've done the research, I do not believe the story that Billy really got to know George Martin when Sergeant Pepper came to be, which was Billy's baby. I believe that Billy has been in the timeline for a very long time, probably going back as early as 1962, maybe even before that. Who knows? So, uh, so when, when we read stuff like that, where he and George Martin are working very closely, collaborating very well, it says to me that they are used to working together, that they are a team and that they have worked together before. I mean, that's, that's what it says to me. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention, Ofer, before you go on with in my life and Billy saying that, you know, he wrote that with John and talking about the lyrics in, my presentation, Did the Beatles Write All Their Own Music? I did a whole piece on In My Life, and I showed the original lyrics that John allegedly wrote, and it was nothing even remotely close to the final version of the lyrics. The original lyrics that we're told that Lennon wrote down were choppy. They were written in prose. I don't, it didn't flow. And then, of course, when we get to the final lyrics, they're brilliant. They're just great, great lyrics. So I think that maybe John did take a stab at it, and uh, it didn't make uh, the mark. And so they had a professional lyricist come in and uh, and pen the lyrics to "In My Life." You know, a lot of the lyrics in the in the Beatles' uh, early songs, I believe, too mature. They, they, they reflect too much life experience for guys that were in their early twenties. Like the song for no one, as an example. That's one of my favorite ones to yes. pick. You know? Anyway, I, I don't want to digress, but I just wanted to cover that. I just didn't want to pass that opportunity up to talk about the lyrics when you mentioned it in my life. And I just wanted to finish up about the thing, the, the, the discrepancy between Paul not knowing to read and write music, and then we find find out that he did, which is very confusing. Um, on a later page in the same book, many years from now, by Barry Miles, um, there is the mention of Golden Slumbers, which is from Abbey Road, as we know. Paul wrote a Golden Slumbers at his father's house in Liverpool. Okay. 
Jim McCartney had remarried, giving Paul a stepsister, Ruth, and some of her sheet music was on the piano, including Thomas Decker's lullaby, Golden Slumbers. I liked the word so much, Paul said. I thought it was very restful, a very beautiful lullaby, but I couldn't read the melody, not being able to read music. So I just took the words and wrote my own music. So did you know how to write music or not? Not. I mean, this is very confusing. Yeah. So again, re- reading it in 1997, I mean, I'm sure almost no one paid attention to it. But now this is really, <laughs> this is really strange. Um, so all of this example of, um, conducting the instrumental for a day in the life and then golden slumbers. And so now we know that this is probably Billy and not Paul. Now for the people who go along with the old, the official information, it's Paul McCartney all the way. I mean, he's a genius. I mean, of course he knew how to read and write music and everything is very clear to them. But even if you read many years from now alone, not reading memoirs, not having uh, any information, any new information. There are very, um, I mean, really um, discrepancies that stand out. The book contradicts itself. That's what I'm trying, <laughs> trying to say. Yeah, in fact, um, I, I believe that on page 330 of the book, you mentioned um, in the outline that there's a long paragraph about Paul composing a perfect solo for the piccolo player, David Mason, for Penny Lane. Yes. So on one hand, he's telling us, well, Golden Slumbers, I couldn't read music. So I, you know, I banged out the chords and I came up with my own tune. And then in the book on page 330, it's it's telling us that he composed the perfect solo for Penny Lane. Again, uh, now that you read it, even if you don't have any new information, I mean, it should stand out as very contradictory. Yeah. Very strange. And then at the end, um, towards the end of the book, Paul did not stop with painting. He composed an oratorio for the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic Society. I mean, we know he issued several, I mean, classical music albums. Okay. One of them, by the way, is the Standing Stone, as you know. We see that he is an accomplished musician. I mean, uh, but again, I think this is something that uh, at least should raise an eyebrow for the average reader. I mean, regardless if you're a Beatles fan or not. Yeah. You cannot figure out what's going on <laughs> just reading this book. Yeah. And the thing is, you have to have the wherewithal that when you read a book like this to understand going in to look for discrepancies. I think what a lot of people do is they read the book and then they don't even recognize the discrepancies as they're reading them. They just kind of just read. And one of the things that I've learned with this research into this particular conspiracy is that you just can't read because everything is is layered. There's encoding. And quite frankly, there are mistakes made. Billy does misspeak sometimes. And he may not recall what he said a year or two previously. You know what I'm saying? Yes. And so he... He creates a conflict, but most people, they don't try to reconcile it. They just go with whatever he said on that particular day. It would be very interesting to compare the information in the new book, The Lyrics, because there will be information about 154 songs that he wrote to either this book many years from now or to memoirs or to, and I'm sure there will be discrepancies yeah. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see, to compare versions. Well, also, the new memoirs box set is coming out in October. Let me just read something here. Um, I had, um, said to Tom, if there's any updates to the book, just let me know because people are asking me about when is it going to ship? Is it on time? How can I order it? And I'm talking about the new box set coming out in October. And Tom wrote me, And he said that, uh, let me just read this here. It says that the new version, the box set, has 180 footnotes that will make some obscure parts of the book much more emphatic, sometimes 
disturbingly so. Very interesting. Uh, yes. And uh, he also said that um, there's a big reveal in the box set. I don't know what that is. So I am going to do a video later on today to um, let my audience know what's going on. And uh, But you're the first to hear about this. So the point I'm making is, uh, going back to your point, is that we have these different sources. And uh, for those of us that are doing this research, we have to check multiple sources to see where there are these discrepancies and where these red flags, as you call them, or these holes are, right? So when he comes out with uh, the lyrics and then he comes out with the new box set of memoirs, we're going to have even more information that we have to work our way through to figure out where there are gaps, where there are holes. Yeah, it's going to be very interesting, um, and it's very soon, October, November. I also wanted to mention uh, another thing that I found an interesting comment in this book many years from now, uh, and this is something we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later. Mick Jagger often called at Cavendish Avenue, and it was Paul and Mick who often checked with each other, to make sure that the Beatles and the Stones did not release a new single within the same few weeks, which would have split sales and jeopardized both their chances of reaching number one. Now, when I read this uh, comment, uh, first of all, I think that it was really coordinated behind the scenes. And I don't think Mick Jagger called Paul or Billy every time a new single or new album came out. Right. I mean, this is something that was coordinated. And we'll talk about a little bit later about the uh, my findings because I did check the release dates of albums and singles of the Beatles and the Stones in the UK and in the US. And I found that uh, there was a lot of coordination there, but we'll talk about it. So again, just to summarize, uh, this book many years from now, again, it gives you, it goes along with the official narrative and again, even if you read it by itself and you don't, you're not familiar with the new information, there are a lot of discrepancies there. I was going to ask you this uh, at the end of the of our talk here, but I might as well ask you now. The book is only in Hebrew now, correct? Yes. Okay, so there's no English version of it or any other language. Are there any plans at some point to have it in English? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm hoping but it'll take time. I'm definitely thinking about it. Okay, and for folks that can read Hebrew, how were they able to order the book? How were you getting it fulfilled? Well, the the, the, the print edition is um, on my website, and then there's a digital uh, edition, which is sold on the, one of the major platforms here in Israel. Okay. Which is called Ivrit, uh, which is in English is Hebrew, means Hebrew. And it's basically... Well, I'd, I'd say the big, it's the biggest uh, digital platform for books in Israel. Okay. So they can get it there. All right. So I'll put all the links down below in the description box for those that are interested. Okay. And I really do hope, I mean, I'm not putting any pressure on you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping that you do get the book out in English because personally, I would love to read it. Thanks. Did you want to move on to social engineering? Yes. or Yeah. Okay, so what about social engineering? I know you and I know a lot about this. Let's talk to the audience. Yeah, I wanted to talk about something specific, which, again, this is something that we have to think about um, as a community, which really, I mean, you lead on the subject. But um, we talked about we talk about it a lot, but I noticed that uh, there was a very short period of time between the time period where almost no one knew who the Beatles were until they were the biggest band in the world. This should have taken uh, a lot longer, in my opinion. But this is what I found. October of 1962 was the month where the first official single, Love Me Do, was released in the UK. Okay, At that time, they were, uh, the Beatles were known in two places only. That's Liverpool in the UK and Hamburg in Germany. These are the two uh, places where they played as an unknown group. Okay? So October of 1962, they did get their first, um, well, national exposure in terms of releasing an official single in the UK. 
the song started playing on the radio there. Now, we jump to April of 1964, just 18 months later, a year and a half. And I mark this as the month which officially put them as the biggest band in the world, because on April 4th, they had the entire top five on the Billboard chart. Can't Buy Me Love was number one, and then number two, three, four, and five were all Beatles singles. But this is something that never happened before. Uh, not even with Elvis. It was like the major artist before the Beatles era. Okay? So, October 62, no one knows who the Beatles are worldwide. And in April of 64, which is 18 months later, they're the kings of the world. Now, when I talk to people a little about this, they say, what do you want? They had great marketing. Well, I agree that the marketing was great. But I think this is a stage or this is a phase beyond great marketing. And I'll try to prove uh, my point by saying that in the U.S., until the first quarter of 64, they were not, they, nobody knew who the Beatles were. The very first singles of the Beatles were issued in January of 64. And in fact, what I found is that uh, the people behind the scenes, behind the Beatles project, as you called it, they flooded the American record stores with Beatles products. So in January alone, there were seven singles and two albums by the Beatles issued at once. Now, this is very unusual because usually if you want to break a new artist, you concentrate on, on his new album or a new single or a new single and a new album. But here, uh, what they did in America was that they put a lot of music together. So... Again, if you walked into a store anywhere in America in the first quarter uh, of 1964, the stores were, you, you, there were two albums and seven different singles. This is very unusual, okay? And then you had the three Ed Sullivan shows. The Beatles appeared on Ed Sullivan uh, on three consecutive Sundays. This is what I found. Uh, by the way, the first appearance was on February 9th. Think about the date. Right. right. <laughs> Nine plus two. Uh, and then the following Sunday, and then the following, the third Sunday, they had a taped, uh, so the, uh, taped show. So they got a lot of uh, exposure. Okay. Appearing on Ed Sullivan in prime time. I think this was uh, CBS, if I'm not mistaken. But again, the general idea, what I was thinking about, I mean, the, the marketing push was beyond, beyond a regular marketing push. I mean, this is social engineering. This is telling America, this is, these are the Beatles. You have to buy the product now. It's in the stores. There are seven singles and there are two albums. And again, on the April 4th chart, five, the top five songs were Beatles songs and 12 out of the 100 were Beatles songs all together, which is amazing. I mean, this is something that, uh, I mean, it's very hard to comprehend. It's a massive push. Yes. Way beyond great marketing to me. Yes. Okay. I agree. I agree. And a, a very short period of time, I mean, the first quarter of 64, that's when Beatlemania started in the U.S. So this is something, uh, again, to think about in terms of social engineering. I mean, this is what they did with the product, I mean, with the music. No, I'm glad you're talking about this, Ofer, because this is something that I focus on as well. We have these very short time frames in which big, big things happen. On my own little timeline, I just jotted something down here that I've been meaning to talk about, and I haven't had a chance yet, so I'll, I'll mention it here. The official story tells us that the Beatles arrived in Hamburg mid-1960, I think it was August of 1960, with with their first manager slash handler, Alan Williams. Then in June of 1962, on Biological Paul's birthday, this is what we're told by the official narrative, they signed the contract with EMI. So from August of 1960 to 
June of 1962, when they signed the contract with EMI, only two years had elapsed. That's it. So they show up in Hamburg in August of 1960 as this very rough-around-the-edges band. And then in June of 1962, less than two years later, they inked a contract with EMI and George Martin. And then from June 1962 to March 1963, in March of 1963, on March 22nd, that's when they released their first album, Please Please Me, in the UK. Yes. So only nine months had elapsed from the time that they signed the contract to when Please Please Me was released worldwide. And then 11 months after Please Please Me was released, that's when they show up in the U.S., in February of 1964. So we're looking at this timeline, which is around three and a half years from August 1960 to when they arrive in the U.S. in February of 1964, and we have all of this activity. This is exponential growth, Ofer. This is not gradual. Now, some people, of course, are going to say, well, that's because they were so talented. But what I always ask people to do is to go back to my presentation, did the Beatles write all their own music, and you're going to get a lot of background as to what was really going on with regard to their skill level, what they were capable of, especially when we're talking about time constraints. There was a lot of time compression in the Beatles' schedule to do anything other than to run around and do gigs, especially when they were in Hamburg. I have a, an interview, and I know you've probably heard it, over from Pete Best, where he said that by the time they finished up seven hours of playing in Hamburg at the clubs, and then they went back to the dive that they were living in, and they woke up. They woke up about 3 p.m. in the afternoon, and they had to be back at the club by 6 o'clock. So they had about a two- or three-hour period of time where they got up, they had to eat, they had to get dressed, do whatever. That is what Hamburg was about until much later on when they played the Star Club, where they were um, a lot more polished up, buffed up. And this is because of all the handling that was taking place. That's how this was able to progress. There was a lot of people behind the scenes who were orchestrating this and moving this along. So again, folks, August 1960, they're in Hamburg. Then they sign a contract with EMI in June of 1962, which is less than two years after they arrived in Hamburg, which was August of 1960. And then nine months after they signed the contract with EMI, they release Please Please Me in March of 1963, March 22nd to be specific. And then February 1964, they land in America, and it's referred to as the Beatles conquering America conquering America because they knew they needed the American audience in order for this social engineering project to get legs and to take off and to be effective. They knew it. And that's why they called it conquering America. Anyway, I just wanted to men mention that, Ofer, because I've been meaning to talk about this and I haven't had the chance yet. So the timing is perfect. You just brought this up about this time period. And um, so there you go. And one final note, we have to remind ourselves that there was no internet, no social media. Right. Nothing went viral. I mean, someone behind the scenes made sure that all of this will happen in no time. I mean, every time period that you just mentioned and the time period that I mentioned, it's very fast, very fast. Right. All of these records had to wind up in all of the retail outlets. And I'm just going to focus on the U.S., all of them, not just some of them, all of them. All of the radio stations yes. had to be clued in. Hey, you're playing these records. And like I said, it was a massive machine behind them. That's the only way this could happen. The only way. Let's talk about the release dates. Yes. Okay, so... Um, we mentioned uh, a little earlier in our discussion the fact that um, this comment in the uh, Barry Mars book many years from now about the separation uh, of 
releases between the pills and the stones. Now, let me just explain for a second uh, what I researched. We always, I mean, in, in memoirs, I think it's page 351, but this is also in many of the old books. We know that the Beatles and the Stones were two sides of the same coin. Okay? They were always, always mentioned together. Well, the Beatles were more successful than, uh, more su- successful than the Stones, but the Stones were very successful. Let's not forget that. Now, the thing is, uh, they recorded for two separate record companies. Okay? The Beatles recorded for Parlophone, which is a label under EMI. The Stones recorded for Decca, which to the best of my knowledge were not, Decca was not part of EMI. Okay? So supposedly, in a comp- competitive market, uh, you compete. I mean, artists issues, issue um, singles and albums, and there's a competition, and the results, you can see the results every week on the charts, uh, the album charts, the, the singles chart. Now, although the Beatles and the Stones recorded for two separate companies, uh, I did find that there was a coordination uh, in terms of the release dates of the singles and albums, okay? Which is very interesting because, first of all, this is research that I did outside of memoirs and outside basically of any other uh, um, other Beatles books. And second, what I found is that there was at least a four to six uh, weeks period between releases of singles and albums. And I checked uh, four categories, UK singles, UK albums, US singles, and US albums. Now, between 64 and 1970, this, uh, we had six, well, a little more than six years where the Beatles and Stones, uh, were, uh, out there. Okay. Well, the Beatles started, started before the Stones a little bit. Okay. Right. And we know the Stones continued after 1970. But I'm, I'm just talking about the period of time where both of the groups were active, uh, together during the same time period. And what I found, again, was um, a very clear um, division in terms of release dates. And in fact, many of the singles and albums went to number one. But the Beatles did not interfere with the Stones, and the Stones did not interfere with the Beatles. So they received basically a playing field for which to sell uh, I'm not, and then I'm not saying that there were not, there, there was of course other competition from other artists. That, that's obvious. But just in terms of the Beatles and the Stones, I think almost 90 to 95 percent, percent of the releases were separated at least by a four to six, t- uh, weeks time, time period. Now, if you see it on a consistent basis, it means that someone coordinated it. It didn't happen by chance. I mean, if it was like for one year, for two years, maybe a coincidence. But I think that uh, the whole thing was uh, orchestrated from behind the scenes and uh, with very minor uh, discrepancies or minor, um, maybe very few times where albums were released together. In fact, I found that in the U.S., I think only in 66 or 68, before the holiday seasons, there were albums, new albums by the Beatles and Stones. But this is the exception. Okay? I'm talking about many singles releases in the U.S. and many album releases. And we know both bands were very active between 64 and 70. And uh, they were very popular. Okay? So this is, uh, it seems to me that there was a hidden hand or uh, some sort, you know, some sort of control behind the scenes in terms of the releases. And in fact, many of the albums and the singles went to number one, number two, number three. And uh, this was done in order for each band not to interfere with the release of new music from the other band. Right. This is what I found. So they didn't compete head on. They ensured that there was no conflict. So they separated the release dates so that each band 
could optimize. Yes. Right. So yeah, I mean that, that's a coordinated process, especially like you said, Ofer, when we're talking about over a six-year period of time. We're not talking about a year or two, but over the entire timeline, when they coexisted together, you're saying that this is the pattern that you found. Yes. They didn't compete head on. No. And uh, I found it to be very interesting. And again, this is just uh, basically a point checking the chart books from the UK and the US. I just thought it, it's interesting. No, it was a great piece of work because I, you sent me over a separate document and the amount of work it did was unbelievable. It's very well documented, folks. It's something that I hadn't thought to look at. And then when you presented it, I was like, wow, he's absolutely correct. So excellent work on that one. Thanks. Did you want to talk about the 1960 uh, through 1962 period? Yeah, you mentioned it in one of your, uh, I think, uh, presentations uh, recently. And this is something we talked about before recording this show. And I just wanted to, to get your opinion. We know the Beatles uh, did a lot of shows in Hamburg and Liverpool, but not they did not record any music because they were not signed yet. Okay, we're talking about 1960 through 1962, almost the end of 62. And we were just wondering together what happened with all of the new songs that appeared on the albums, starting with Please Please Me. If those, these songs were written by them, why didn't they test them on the audiences in Hamburg and Liverpool? Which basically, I mean, many bands do. I mean, many bands, if they issue a new song, maybe even before recording it or issuing it as a single, they play it live just to get the feel from the audience, you know, just to, uh, based on the information we have and we know, and I'm not, I'm not saying we did a thorough check on this, but this is just something to think about. Where are these songs, the new songs? And maybe you want to elaborate on this. Well, it's a good point. And I did mention in a commentary video on my Paul is Dead channel that I wanted to look more into the 1960 through 1962 period. I have a lot of notes on it. I have a lot of material on my hard drive where I have to start putting it together. Quite honestly, um, I just haven't had the time to sit down and do a formal workup of the, um, of the assessment. But in the Beatles complete documentary, which goes back to the 1980s, it tells us that Paul McCartney and John Lennon wrote 100 songs between 1956 and 1962 up to the point where they met George Martin. So it is a very good question. So if we're being told they wrote 100 songs in that six-year period of time, where are they? We don't hear those songs in Hamburg. We don't hear or see those songs on the set lists from 1960 through 1962, what we start to see as they are brought along more so and they're getting ready for prime time, we start to see some, quote, original songs appear here and there. Now, one of the more notable examples would be when they did the Decca demos. I think there were three songs, three or four songs that were original compositions that were uh, recorded for the Decca demo. Now, that's three or four songs out of what? 100 songs that we're told that they wrote between 56 and 1962? The Decca demo was in, I forgot the exact date, but it was in 1962. So we, do, we really don't see any new compositions until they're getting closer and closer to where the switch is thrown and they're getting ready for worldwide prominence. So the point I'm making is that up until that point, once we follow the timeline, as I mentioned before, 1960 Hamburg, June 1962, they signed the contract with EMI, March of 1963, please, please me, February of 1964, they're in the U.S. So we start to see some new material or original compositions kind of emerge in that 1962 time frame. Now, some people will point back and say, oh, there are versions of uh, One After 909 and uh, I'll Follow the Sun uh, that go back to uh, 1960. Problem with that is that 
we have no way of verifying when those versions of those songs were actually written. And because we're just being told that a particular song was recorded in 1960, based upon what we know about this story and how they have fabricated so much of it, you have two choices. You could take it at face value and believe the official narrative that tells you that 1960, or you could say, now hold on a second. We really don't know. And in order to know, you have to investigate and you have to research. And even with a massive amount of investigation and research, it's still not going to be possible in many cases because you don't have access to the actual records, the files, the logs, whatever it is that's out there. But the key point is because some people want to debate one song, two songs, oh, this song appeared in early 1962 and so on. Okay, that's great. Okay, my explanation for that is the pump was being primed. So they were being fed songs to perform and calling them original compositions. But let's go back to the official narrative and what it tells us. 100 songs were written between 1956 and 1962. Where are they? And the other point I want to make, just a side note, one after 909, that title of that song is also the same year that Alistair Crowley published The Book of the Law in 1909. So we have that connection again. Everything around the Beatles has connection points that are tied into the occult. It just is. A lot of people, they hate hearing this. They don't want to hear this. But, you know, once we march down the research path and you do it in an objective way, it's there. It's just there, you know. So anyway, the point I'm trying to make over your observation is the same observation that I made. Where are all of these original songs? And then when we go to the 1962 Mercy Beat article, which was August, September of 1962, what does that article tell us in black and white? That they were going to London to record songs that were written for them and were given to them by their record producer, George Martin. So again, if you wrote all of these songs and they were just great songs, maybe not all 100 were great songs, but let's just say you had 10, 15 that you thought were worthy. Why are you recording songs that were written for you? In any case, I mean, these are all questions that, that have to be asked. And uh, at some point, I, I will sit down and get the 1960 through 1962 period formalized. I don't know how long a presentation is going to be, uh, because these things take a long time, as you know, Ofer. The, the research that goes in behind this stuff is not something you you just whip up in a week or so. It takes a very, very long time to dig into these things, because you have to cover so many bases uh, because you don't want to look foolish. <laughs> you don't want to put something out there and somebody's like, oh, you missed that. That was very obvious, you know. I mean, and sometimes we do miss things. Clearly we do, you know. But uh, anyway, I hope I answered your question. I, and I have a follow-up question. Uh, this is also something that we talked about on that subject. The first seven albums, all the way up to Revolver, and we know that during this time period, they performed a lot around the world. Yes. Was there ever a situation that songs which are coming on any of, on a new album were performed during live shows before the album came out? So was there ever a situation that they tested songs in front of a live audience? And I think the answer is uh, zero. But maybe there are exceptions. I mean, we have to check that. But from what we know, from what we've seen, this was not the situation. So this also raises the quest the question of did they write their their own material or did they write and compose their own material? And I think we know the answer. I mean, uh, <laughs> but uh, this is something to think about. I mean, because. Um, Many other bands, I mean, when they write new music, even before they record it on an official single or album, they, they test it uh, live. 
I mean, not not all the time and not always, but uh, I think with the Beatles, this never happened. Yeah, that's a very good point. Now, I don't know. Uh, I'd have to go take a look, but I would, based upon the work that I did where I did break down the albums and I started looking at some of the uh, concert tours, I don't think they ever previewed a song prior to the song being released on an album on a later date. I don't think that happened. Now, you know, some artists don't do that, in all fairness. Okay. But there are artists that do do that in order to start to break the song in. But it is another indicator that uh, something is up. You know, why wouldn't that happen? Because like you said, Ofer, they they were playing an enormous number of shows. And what would it have taken to say, hey, you know, this is a song that's, that's coming up, that's going to be released on an upcoming album. I hope you guys enjoy it and then play it, you know. So I don't know. It's just another one of those things that we uh, we need to look at and examine. And like I've always said with this conspiracy, like with any conspiracy, it's not just one thing that defines the conspiracy. You have to look at a multitude of dots that you need to connect. The example I use, Ofer, is let's just say you have a table full of marbles. The entire table is just marbles. Let's just say there's a thousand marbles on the table. Most people have their face so close to the table that when you ask them how many marbles are there, they'll say, oh, three. And then when you ask them to please pick their head up and get the bigger picture, then they see a table that has a thousand marbles on it. And that's the thing. Whenever you do research, you've got to pick your head up <laughs> and you've got to see the 1,000 marbles. Those are the 1,000 connection points. Those are the dots that you want to try to connect. If you're only seeing three and you connect the three, then you're going to have a partial story. You're going to have something that is a subset of a much, much bigger picture. And that's probably the best way I can explain it. Uh, that's a good point. <laughs> And then a good observation, because every time you go and check something, I mean, new stuff pops out, and you go and try to figure out what's going on. Really do a lot of critical thinking, because um, there's a lot of strange uh, things that happened, and I mean, we covered a few today, And uh, but you really have to do a lot of critical thinking. And at least ask questions. I mean, if, in, even if we don't have, I mean, clear answers. And again, we're talking about the biggest band in the world. I mean, the, the genius that is the Beatles. It's not some uh, unknown group or uh, this is a group that defined a generation. And as you've mentioned, I mean, even today, when you talk about the 60s, I mean, I know many great songs from the 60s, which are not... Just uh, not just the Beatles, you know. But whenever you talk about the 60s with people, the Beatles always come come up. The Beatles were the 1960s. Yes. From a pop music perspective, they were. They defined the 1960s. They were the at the head of the parade. The rest of the British Invasion and some great great bands and great music, but really they were following the Beatles' lead. You know, and Jimi Hendrix and, you know, Hendrix was a whole different take on guitar playing, but Hendrix came once the psychedelic era was, was kicked off. So Jimi was attached to the psychedelic era. And what really kicked off the psychedelic era? Well, many people will argue that it was Sgt. Pepper. And we had the Monterey Pop Festival in 1967, which was the summer of love. So, you know, that's, that's how it worked. It, it is all orchestrated. It is all engineered. It's all there to engineer society, to transform society. And the Beatles are a main cog, a very main cog in that wheel. And again, people find it hard to believe that um, a lot of major points from the old official narrative are not what we were told. I mean, this is, I mean, it's very difficult to digest, and I, I understand that. And people worship the Beatles, I mean, in Israel too. <laughs> but if you try to separate your worship from just the, uh, you know, the basic facts or the basic uh, ideas of what happened, 
then you get a completely different picture. I used to worship the Beatles over and, you know, and it was a very hard pill for me to swallow. You know, I think a lot of people think that, you know, I'm just here to to destroy the Beatles legacy and to destroy the Beatles story. And I'm not doing that at all. I was a huge, huge Beatle freak. I worshiped the Beatles. It's the whole reason why I got into music. I played guitar. I wrote songs and all of that. So it was very difficult to get into this and start to come to certain realizations. But it is what it is. Once you come at it from a uh, an objective perspective, you can start to see it for what it's worth. And you can also see that the Beatles and that whole psychological operation is part of a much, much larger initiative that's been going on for decades and decades and decades to socially engineer and transform our societies and our culture. You know, and that's the thing. And once you understand the bigger picture and you then you see that the Beatles are tucked in under that umbrella, then I think it becomes a little easier to understand what went on with the Beatles, what went on with the Rolling Stones, what went on with Led Zeppelin. And we can go on and on and on. But in any case, I, I'm digressing here a little bit. Now, I think you had a question over about the Beatles Our World television program that was broadcast on June 25th, 1967. And they were playing All You Need Is Love. And there is a scene in the footage where George Martin pushes a button on the console. And your question to me was, Mike, is he pressing the playback button or is he playing the record button? So I think that's your question, right? So tell me some more. First of all, the, the video was uh, taken off the Internet just recently. I don't know why. I have a video of, uh, well, collection of the Beatles number ones, the, the, uh, the videos for the number one singles. So I watched it there, but uh, it was online and a few months ago it was taken off the air. I don't know why. At the beginning of the video, we see George Martin sitting in the control room and uh, he pushes a button, he presses a button and the music starts. I was wondering whether he's pushing the record button or the playback button. Uh, I think he's pushing the playback button. <laughs> That's my take. I think Billy tells us, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, in memoirs that it was uh, it was a playback that they were singing to a recorded track. Well, all of the videos where you see them play, the singles are all playback. That's for sure. Yes, because you hear the singles version, so you know that this is a uh, playback. Yeah, so that live, quote, live version of All You Need Is Love was not live. The only thing live was the vocals. Yeah, John's John's vocals, I think. But, yeah. And we see this, like you said, in the videos. Uh, one of the recent examples that I pointed out to my audience is if you take a look at the video of Revolution, what you're hearing in the background is the actual recorded track, the instrumentation, and then the Beatles were singing live for the video. And that was the model, by the way. Uh, the model was either they lip-synced. I'm talking about bands in general. When you watched a lot of these variety shows back in the 1960s and 1970s, they did a lot of uh, shows where um, they were lip-syncing. And the reason why is because they want to make sure that there's no mistakes. You want to be able to get through the song, present the band in the best light. It's basically it. It's marketing. It's promoting a product, it's a brand, that's how it's done. And uh, the Beatles were no exception to that rule. So, And I know I've caused a lot of consternation with some people when I started pointing out certain anomalies with their live performances. Were they playing to backing tracks? Uh, were there offstage or backstage musicians that were playing these riffs in order to make sure that they got pulled off properly, that it sounded right and so on, you know? George Harrison missing the, the chord was very obvious on I Feel Fine. Oh, missing the playing, yeah, for, for uh, Day Tripper. Day Tripper, excuse me. Yeah, that was in Budokan. That's very, very obvious. And I, I've actually had people write me that, you know, people that are in the know, people who are in the industry, people who do this type of work. In other words, they were the backstage or offstage musician, or they were the person that created backing tracks for these bands. And this still goes on today, by the way. This is not something that just happened back in the 1960s. In fact, 
it's very prevalent today, but the technology has advanced to the point where it appears seamless. Yeah. I have one person, a really good person. He's a, a sound engineer and he's been in the business over for a very, very long time. And I can't say who this person is and I can't even point to a particular album that he showed me that he worked on. And it was a live album of a band. I'm not going to give any out any details because I cannot give up who this person is. I don't want him to wind up in any kind of hot water. But he showed me how this was done, how this, this album was put together. It's, it's unbelievable how they layer it and create it, how they redo parts that didn't come out right when they were uh, recording, maybe during the concert, how crowd noises are enhanced. Uh, it's just unbelievable. And I, and I listened to this one link he sent over to me and my jaw just dropped. And he, what he was telling me is, Mike, this is what is done. And this is what people are listening to, but it's not real in a sense because so much post-production work had gone into it that this is not what you heard if you went to the concert. If you actually sat there and listened to the concert and then you bought the CD afterward, you're not hearing the same thing. Because when they go put an album out or they're going to release a documentary or concert footage for public consumption, that thing is going to be buffed up. It's going to be polished up to make sure the best possible versions of those songs, the best possible production and listening experience is going to come forth. People forget it's called the music business. It's a business. They're not there to not make money. They're there to make lots of money. And they're going to make sure that all of the spit and polish and flash is going to be there in order to make their product appealing so that people buy it. Yeah, so the whole thing with uh, All You Need Is Love is another example of where they were playing to a backing track, singing to a backing track, I should say. Okay, so that's uh, that's basically, basically the, the topics um, that I wanted to cover. We're still, the good thing I think is we're still learning a lot about the industry, about the world, and maybe most importantly about ourselves because uh, we live here and uh, the reality shows us all kinds of things that we have to try and figure out what's going on. And uh, that's that's the lesson, I think. And in you. Well, let me ask you this question, Ofer. I get this question asked all the time, so I'll ask another researcher the questions that I get asked, and I'm sure you've been asked it many times. Why is this important? Why are you spending time looking at this? Big deal. So they swapped out a guy. You know, that's funny because I, your words are in my book, <laughs> what you just said now. I said uh, some some guys think it's not an important as long as the music is great. So they switched the guy. But I think that, um, again, it reflects on the music business, on show business in general, and on the world. I mean, because... Uh, if they could, put, they could pull such an operation, and people still can't believe that uh, the whole thing is very different from what we've been told. I mean, this is really, I mean, this is one of the main points. I mean, um, and I think that the lesson here is that. Uh, First of all, don't worship anyone, a politician, a musician, a movie star, a sports star. Right. Uh, and you really have to crit critically think about a lot of things. I mean, the Beatles, this is like the, the last sacred, sacred cow, or uh, I don't know what to call it. And if this is something which is very different from what we've been told, then it's a lesson for us about other things that are going on around the world. Right. And at least we, we have to ask questions. I mean, we, we don't have, always have the exact answer or the clear answer. 
because a lot of times uh, the people behind the scenes are trying to uh, really fool us. I mean, there's some truth, but there are many lies, and they cover things up. And, um, I mean, people still cannot believe that the Beatles did it. I mean, uh, um, the, the, the old information is, is so stuck in their heads that uh, they don't want to see that uh, maybe the stuff is not exactly as what we were told, we've been told for so many years. So I think there's a lesson here. I mean, it's a good, le- it's a sad lesson maybe, but it's a good lesson also because uh, we keep learning about uh, the world. Yeah, it tells you, look, if they can do it here, where else are they doing it? And uh, what you believe is true may not be true, that you are pulled into embracing illusion. And ultimately, that illusion is going to steer you into certain directions. It's going to shape your belief system. It may shape your morals, your ethics. It may alter how you might make decisions on things. And I'm not just talking about the Beatles. I'm talking about how this whole world is a construct of illusion. And that's why, to me, the Beatles conspiracy is very important because once you can get your head wrapped around this, you're like, okay, well, if they can do it here, they can do this anywhere on any topic, you know. So anyway, I really appreciate you coming on the show, Ofer, and you know that you can come on anytime because I really do enjoy speaking with you. Your research is top-notch. And uh, you've dug into areas that, you know, I haven't looked into and other researchers haven't. So, you know, we have a loose uh, group of researchers that were networked into. I, I view you as one of those folks. And between all of us, it's probably about, you know, six of us or so, we help each other to fill gaps that, you know, I haven't touched and others haven't touched, you know. So we're able to fill in more of the picture. We have more parts to the puzzle that we can put together and we can see the bigger picture that way. So I really, really do appreciate uh, all of your work and you did a great job. And, and congratulations on your book. Thank you very much. And it's always a pleasure to, to be on your show. And again, it'll be very interesting to see how it ends and when we get <laughs> some ending line or, or ending point where we know what we got right, what we got wrong. Some vindication. <laughs> and you mentioned, just one, one final note, you mentioned in one, I don't recall, one of your presentations that the end result or, or when we know, when we know what happened, hopefully, whenever this happens, may be even a lot worse than what we know today. It's possible. I mean, maybe there are other areas or there are other major things that we are not even considering right now because it's a process. It'll be very interesting. I'm just hoping we <laughs> we get some sort of a final, I don't know, an answer and look back and see what what we got right. And uh... <laughs> Well, I, I read a part of Tom's note earlier, Ofer, so going to your point about is there stuff that we don't know about? Does it go deeper? Does it go darker? I don't know. I mean, I have found with this conspiracy, anything is possible. It, it seems like an endless rabbit hole. And so if I go back to what Tom wrote me, he said that the new book has 180 footnotes that will make some obscure parts of the book, he's talking about memoirs, more emphatic, sometimes disturbingly so. Now, I don't know what that means. That sounds to me like there's going to be some information in the book that's going to rock some boats. So we'll just wait and see, and it's, uh, it's coming. Up. Exactly. Again, thanks for uh, having me on your show. We'll probably meet in the future and see, <laughs> reflect back on uh, these shows and, and, uh, and this show and other shows. Yeah. And uh, we'll learn more, and that's that's always important to me, just to learn. Well, maybe that February 2023 date that Billy has hinted at, I think it's on page 13 of Memoirs. Yeah. Maybe that is a moment in time where 
a lot more information will come out. I don't know. I don't know. But it seems like, I'm not even, I'm not even going to say it seems like, he is in a flurry of activity right now, putting information out, right? We've got the new memoirs box set coming out. We have the lyrics coming out. He did Hulu 321. He's got, uh, the Get Back documentary by Peter Jackson. Aside uh, from all of the talk shows and everything else he's doing on social media. So these are major, major deliverables. And this is what I was told earlier on was going to happen as the runway got shorter and shorter on him, that there was going to be this, this flurry of activity. But I was also told, and you know, it was, it was Tom, and it's also in the book, that uh, we won't have full disclosure until after he, after he passes away. Now, how soon after he passes away? I have no idea. It could be years. I hope it's sooner or later because I would really like to stop doing this. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, well, Ofer, it's, I know it's in the evening there for you in Israel. Uh, again, thank you so, so much for uh, coming on the show. Uh, if you could send me the links to your website okay. and uh, I'll include that in the description box so people can go to your website. Pick up the book, and uh, and I'll try to have the show out as soon as I possibly can. Thanks a lot, and uh, I'll see you soon. And that concludes another Sage Okoye interview, and I hope you enjoyed the discussion as much as I did. Links to my guests' websites and social media are listed in the description box below. And as always, I would like to thank everyone for listening and visiting the blog. You can find all my social media and web links by visiting my hub website at sageofkoye.com. Also, if you get a moment please visit laboroflovemusic.com to check out my music and album releases. And remember, live in truth and always serve creation. It's really that simple. See everyone with the next show. Be safe, enjoy, and God bless. Who knows?